I'm Meredith Blackwell and this is John Pitt and we're going to have an interview with John. John, I first met you, I think, in Tampa. Were you at Tampa, uh, the Second International Mycological Congress? Yes, that's right, Meredith. Yeah. That's, that's where I would have met mm -hmm. you. Yeah. That was my first international congress of yeah. this sort. Yeah. And Lena was there. I remember Lena with her baby at the time. All right. Yes. I met a large number of people there that yes. I'd only heard of before. Yes, I did too. So, mm. what about letting us know a little bit about your early life and your okay. family and all? Mm. I grew up on a, a small farm uh, in New South Wales, Australia, not very far from Sydney. And life on the farm was fairly hard. Money was hard to come by. And when I finished high school at a, a good local high school, I had enough, a good enough grades to go to university, but not good enough grades to get a scholarship to go full time. So I really had to get a job and go to university part time if I was going to do something other than stay on the farm, which is what my father wanted me to do. He was never happy that I left. I didn't know what to do, so I talked to a family friend, one of the few professionals around whom I knew at all, and he said, oh, he said, uh, work in food technology, he said. You, th there's always going to be something to do because people will always need food. So when I went to Sydney looking for a job, I was lucky enough to find an advertisement for a job in CSIRO, which is the Australian Government Research Organisation, and I felt at that time that I would never be smart enough to be someone in that organisation, but the job came up for a technical assistant, grade one junior, and I was still 16 at that time. I went for an interview, and I've never forgotten it, because having had about 10 minutes discussion with the man who was doing the interview, he said, well, he said, there were six people applied for this job. Only two of you had qualified to go to university. The other fellow hasn't turned up, so the job is yours. <laughs> that's the only job Luck. interview I've ever done in my life. And as John Taylor said in the interview, which he did recently with you, uh, luck is so important. That was my first big piece of luck because I got a job with CSIRO and I've been there ever since. I started as a technical assistant. I finished as a chief research scientist and I'm the only person who ever went through all of the research grades in the whole organization in a lifetime. And yeah, I, I saw something you'd been there over, what, 60 over years? Over 60 years now, yes. Yes, I started And I there wondered at how that had been because I don't think you're old enough, but <laughs> yes. if you started at 16. I am quite old enough, yes, you to started have been there. At 16, so I started, yeah. I was just before my 17th birthday. So did you go to university? I went to during? university in Sydney. The University of New South Wales was a newly established university and I was able to do a part-time degree in food technology. It was a seven-year course part-time, mostly night, night uh, subjects, of course, because I had a full-time daytime job. And it took me eight years to get through that. But when I finished that degree, I thought I might try to do some more work and go further if I can. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And the possibility of doing a master's degree came up during my uh, undergraduate work, I had become fascinated by microbiology uh, amongst the various topics that we did in food, in food science. And so when the opportunity came up to do a, a master's degree, one of the possible topics that appealed to me was working with the fungi that occurred on dried plums, on prunes. The reason being that uh, prunes were always sold uh, dry and they were quite safe, but new marketing suggested that they should be high moisture but the Australian system did not allow the use of preservatives. So people were simply boiling up prunes and hot filling them into pouches and they were going mouldy. And when I did my master's degree on those, I came across the whole topic of mycology, which I hadn't really encountered, and also all of the xerophilic fungi, the ones that grow under low moisture that occur in subject, substrates like that. And that gave me a very good grounding in, in what I should do. Now, luck again played a part because having got through that master's, I thought, well, it's possible I may be able to do a PhD. And we had a, a man working with my boss from the University of California, and he invited me to come to who, Davis. Who was that? That was uh, Martin Miller. Oh, okay. Now, yeah. Marty was a yeast man. And he said, if you'd like to come to California, now CSIRO said, yes, you can have the time to do that. We'll actually pay your salary. 
uh, on top of what you would get as a, a graduate student. So I had a little more money than the average grad student. Mm -hmm. So we went, my wife and I went to uh, California. I did my, my PhD at the University of California in Davis on yeast taxonomy. I was extremely lucky that when I was finishing that degree, I saw an advertisement from the USDA in Peoria, Illinois, the Northern Regional Research Center, who were looking for someone to work on fungi in, uh, in baked, uh, sorry, in um, refrigerated doughs, which had, were going moldy and which they had a, quite a large collection of, of penicilliums that they would like to have classified. Well, in my master's work, I had in fact identified three penicillia. I now know that two of them were wrong, completely <laughs> wrong. But I applied for this because USDA were offering scholarships that were independent of where you came from, unlike most of the universities who were, which were strictly for US students. And I was able to get a year's postdoc at the Northern Regional Lab in Peoria. Now that of course was where Ken Raper had worked and where the books on Aspergillus and Penicillium had been written. And there I was able to come across the culture collection that Ken Raper had actually used for doing his work with penicillium. And that gave me the cultures that I could work from to understand what he had done and how he had done it. What, what year about the... That was 1968-69. Okay. So he had already gone to He'd Wisconsin. already gone to Wisconsin by that time, but the collection was still there. Dorothy Fennell had, had, had also left. So the collection was there, but no one to work as a guide. So I simply spent a year in working through that collection and saying, yes, I think I could do something with this. I, the book itself that they've written is really quite difficult to use. There must be better ways. And I started thinking about those. I also came across mycotoxins for the first time because there was also an active mycotoxin group there. Now, when I had gone back to Sydney from finishing, uh, when I went back to Sydney after finishing that year's postdoc, my institution, which was a, a food research part of CSIRO, had got a new director. And he wanted to know what I was going to do when I came back. He'd only just met me. And I told him that I would like to be a mycologist. He looked at me for 30 seconds and said, I don't need a mycologist. Why would I want a mycologist? And I sat there looking stunned. And he said, yes, I do actually need a mycologist because I want someone to keep a watching brief on mycotoxins. If you'll do that, then you can be a mycologist and you can do more or less what you like within our framework. And that set me up on, on the rest of my career because I continued to work then with penicillium um, and, and sort of think about it and think about how I might someday revise the, the book. Now, the next piece of luck to me was that I also, um, having thought that I would like to work on penicillin, that I looked at the places I might do this, and one of these was the Mycological Institute in Kew. And I had suggested to my boss, my new boss, that maybe I would like to go there and do some work with, with penicillium. And suddenly one day he said, yes, you can do that. You can have a whole year to do that, provided you go to this conference and talk about water relations of fungi, which I had been working on since I came back. And about three months before I went to, uh, to the UK to do that, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to hire someone to work with me for the first time, and even luckier to hire a lady called Ailsa Hocking, who has worked with me now for 40 years. And uh, we have had a collaboration that has led to results that neither of us could ever have done by ourselves. Just having the two people to work together and think together made such a difference. Mm -hmm. So I went to Kew for a year and worked on penicillium, and I continued working on that when I came back. So you got a year off it. for giving a, a paper off. at a meeting? Yes, essentially. It was a sabbatical in a sense. I'd yeah. been with the organization for quite a time, and although we didn't have sabbaticals, I had a, a chief who happened to like taxonomy and think that it was worth doing. Mm -hmm. What was his name? Uh, Michael Tracy. Okay. He was a bio biochemist by trade, but he was fascinated by taxonomy as such. Uh, not necessarily of fungi, but just of taxonomy, of classification of organisms and, and things in general. And he stood by me when my own boss said, ah, oh, we don't need to know what sort of moulds there, we just pasteurise it out, it doesn't matter. But the big boss felt this was an important thing still to keep doing. 
So I had been, had this opportunity to, to go to London for a year uh, where I worked at CMI with David Hawksworth and with um, particularly with David who advised me so much on uh, classification, uh, correct names, how to put the correct names on the organisms I was working with to get the taxonomy of the genus up to date. And also with people like Brian Sutton and Brian Booth and the others there who provided me with various advice. Now, the real reason I'd gone there was because Nan Onions was there, Penicillium person there. Yeah. And Nan and I worked together. I think I advised her more than the other way, but she provided me with the, the opportunity and the cultures and, and the system they had. Now, the culture collection there was not in terribly good shape because, like most collections, they transferred cultures regularly. And Raper had shown that the best thing to do with these was to freeze dry them. Now, when I came back from Northern Regional Lab, I was able to bring quite a large number of his cultures to Sydney with me. And those formed the basis of the work I did with penicillium later. Did you know Raper at all? I met him only once, and that was at the, the conference in Tampa. Mm -hmm. I had a, a poster about penicillium there, a quite an extensive poster, saying how I intended to sort of realise what he'd done and, and, and do a taxonomy. This was now by 1977. I was well advanced with that work. And Dr. Raper came and looked at that poster and he looked it up and down and he said hello and he thought of one species there. He said, yes, that, that fits quite well. Yes, that's, that's, that's okay. But then someone, uh, another a person asked him, Dr. Raper, what do you think of all this work? And he looked at this other person, he said, it's all totally unnecessary and turned on his heel and walked away. <laughs> Which is what you might oh have gosh. expected <laughs> Ken Raper were, to have done. You were quite young at the time. I'm still quite young at the time, <laughs> yes. Encounter with Raper. <laughs> yeah, he was Raper, that was it. So in due course, I, I published a book on penicillium and I sat there for a few weeks thinking, well, that should last for a long time because I've done what I believe is good morphological work with this genus. I've had extremely good advice from my colleagues as to how to do this properly. And it lasted, I suppose, for about two years. It was reviewed not very well by some of my colleagues who shall remain nameless, and the book almost disappeared. But there was a German man I'd met at uh, other conferences who said, look, I like what you've done. I think it's worthwhile. I, I believe that you've done a, a good taxonomy. Why don't you come to work with Germany, to Germany and work with me and reorganize my collection for me? And that gave me the confidence to keep thinking about going on with this. And who was that? That was a man called Felix Leisner. And he was a very good meat microbiologist, but not one that mycologists would ever have come across. Now, during this sort of time, there was a lot of discussion about what should be done with the classification of these fungi. And while we were in a different world completely looking at, at food mycology as such, there was the time when we were standing around a fireplace somewhere and Rob Sampson said, we really must have a meeting to sort out the taxonomy and to form a system where we can get together and get the classification of these organisms done properly because there's a young man called Jens Frisvard who is starting to produce a new classification based on secondary metabolites. And we really have to get these concepts together and get your concepts and my concepts together. And Rob brought me into the system and said, yes, we've really got to organize and work together. And from that, he and I developed a long co uh, collaboration where um, at his suggestion we started the International Commission on Penicillium and Aspergillus and we um, worked over the taxonomy of, of Penicillium and to some extent Aspergillus you as well. You were one of the first, weren't you? Yes, the, 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 he, he and I were really the first people who set that up directly. But one of these international commissions. Yes, we were one of the first of these real international commissions of that type. Now, I didn't do just taxonomy. Because my job was also to understand food mycology, and when I finished penicillium, Ailsa Hocking and I sat down and, and thought, what are we going to do now? And the concept came to us of writing a book about our experiences, because by this time we'd done a lot of isolating of fungi from foods, and we understood, once I understood the taxonomy of penicillium, the rest of the taxonomy wasn't that hard. 
And so we then set about writing a book which we called Fungi and Food Spoilage. Now, the concept of food mycology as a discipline, rather than just being an offshoot of, of something else, had come about in the 1970s where uh, Larry Bouchard, an American, had written a book called uh, Food and Beverage Mycology. And the title Food Mycology really came out of that. But Larry was looking at the use of these organisms in manufacturing foods, whereas our concept of food mycology was the spoilage of foods. And so the book that we wrote was called Fungi and Food Spoilage. The first edition we published in 1985 in Sydney and hardly anyone saw it at all. Uh, that was in 1985. In, uh, 1995, 18, 1995, sorry, 1997, we published the second edition in London with a company called Blackie Academic and Professional. It was a much larger book. We'd done a lot more work. And that company was sold six weeks after we had published, and the book vanished completely. Um, it just was passed from pillar to post, and no one ever saw it. Much later, uh, Springer in New York, we approached, said, yes, we'd be very happy to produce another, another edition for you. And the third edition, 2009, uh, has sold very well because they marketed it much better and because they had developed a system of allowing people to download chapters electronically. Mm -hmm. And so Fungi and Foods Bullage has, has done very well. Now, Along with all of that, I still had to work on mycotoxins. I had to keep an idea on what was happening in mycotoxins. And suddenly in around 1975, 78, Australia started having trouble with aflatoxin in peanuts. Now, aflatoxin came around in Europe and England much earlier, the whole story of turkey X disease and, and death of poultry for Christmas. The problems of peanuts and aflatoxin were well known, but the Australian industry did not have a problem until the mid-1970s. And early in 19, the 1980s, the problem got much worse, and we were able to get a grant to start work on the, what was going on with aflatoxin in peanuts in Australia. Did you figure out why it came on so suddenly? I've never really known. I'd never been able to work out just where this came from, because Aspergillus flavus, I'm quite sure, is native to Australia. Aspergillus parasiticus, I don't think so. I think it's a South American fungus, mm -hmm. and I think it was introduced, I, I felt, probably with peanuts. But other people have told me that, in fact, parasiticus arrived in Australia with sugarcane, because originally it's a parasite of the mealybug of sugarcane, and sugarcane had been brought into Australia with the first fleet in 1788, and probably each mm -hmm. subsequent fleet had brought more a sugar cane. Was it widely grown sugar cane or mostly Queensland? Or yes, in Queensland. Queensland. And the peanuts are also grown in Queensland. Now, I still don't know whether the parasiticus we get from peanuts is the one that came from sugar cane or came from peanuts in the first place. And this is just uh, an aside point. Do you know where they were introduced from? I, I think uh, they would both have come from South America originally, I think. And I think it may have been that this influx of parasiticus finally got into the peanut crop in Australia and, and increased our problem with aflatoxin a lot. Mm -hmm. So in the early 1980s, we were able to get grants and start looking at aflatoxin in peanuts. My interest, of course, as a mycologist was, uh, what does it do, how's it get on, what are the numbers like, the, the basis of all of this, and we did a number of years of work on that. The possibility of Controlling the aflatoxin came up around 1990, and we started work on biocontrol of aflatoxin around that time, and I've sort of done work on biocontrol more or less ever since. Uh, the fact that in the last year I've decided it's not nearly as good a process as I had believed for the previous 30 uh, is one of those things that, that just happens in life, isn't it? But um, I just spent a lot of time doing work on biocontrol. Field, field trials particularly are expensive, uh, time-consuming, and very difficult to have go well because there are simply too many variables in this. In Australia, we don't have a lot of problems with some of the other mycotoxins, particularly the fusarium toxins, but we do get okra toxin in dried fruit and, and we've done quite a lot of work in that area as well. So I've really worked in food mycology, food methods, um, 
water relations of, of fungi, um, taxonomy of, of the fungi that grow in foods, particularly penicillium, mycotoxin research, particularly on, on aflatoxin. And those sort of different areas I've tried to juggle during the time I've worked with CSIRO. Since you were a food person, what about, are there many uh, Aspergillae and penicillia that are penicillins that are isolated from nature. Uh, do you have endemics in Australia? Yes. On top of that, the the food ones are, are pretty well universal. They mm -hmm. came with the with the grains. They came with the food stuff. So we get exactly the same species as as other countries for in almost all cases. But there is, of course, a, a very large endemic collection of Aspergillus and Penicillium species in the Australian environment because it's been separate from everywhere except mm -hmm. perhaps South Africa for a very long time. And only once did I get the opportunity to, to look seriously at these organisms in Australia. Although in the early days, we, when we were really looking for Aspergillus flavus in the peanut uh, land, we, we did isolate other things that looked interesting. And some of those I'm still trying to publish now. Mm -hmm. We did one serious piece of work looking at penicilliums in the Sydney Basin. I had, was lucky enough to get a grant to do that. It was right outside the food work and my organisation wasn't terribly happy about it. And we found so many new penicillium species that still haven't been described that uh, it's just mind boggling. Uh, there could easily be 200 species in, the, in, in that work that we've done. And I think if one were to really try to do Australia uh, properly that there are hundreds of species of Aspergillus and Penicillium out there. I also know that if you do this in South Africa, where Cobus Visage has done work uh, relatively recently, that there's a considerable overlap between what we see around Sydney and what he sees in South Africa. So do you think there's Gondwanan? Yes, I think oh, it's Gondwanan. Really? Yeah, okay. I think a lot of these, the soil type of Penicillium are probably Gondwanan. Mm -hmm. the, uh, subgenus penicillium ones are all associated with grains and we've just got the same ones that places like Europe have. Yeah. If ever anyone did uh, penicillium and aspergillus in South America properly, we would find some of the same ones again, mm -hmm. but again a large group of ones that are different and separate from, and a lot of these are different separate from the Northern Hemisphere because they've been uh, away from the Northern Hemisphere for so long. Yeah. So there's still a great deal of work of that kind to be done. I was just curious because I actually could collected a penicillium in the field one time. Yes. It looked like a slime mold. I mean, I was collecting slime molds. It was oh, yeah. all over leaves on, in a riverine area in Arizona. Mm. And I think it is probably an endophyte. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Are many penicillium endophytes? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, but huh. one thing we did which startled me was that this lady who, who did a, a PhD with me was thought that she would she was really an ecologist and she took a particular leaf off a particular plant that was native to the local area and she looked in gardens and and really um, untouched environments and I said look penicillia don't grow on leaves this is not going to work mm -hmm. you can't believe the number of penicillia she found from the leaves of that plant that we simply didn't find even from soil in the surrounding areas mm -hmm. So there is something going on there which I don't know about and, and which I won't have the chance to ever, ever follow. This was a Cenematis thing. I think Rob knows the name it's of it. It's a Tauromyces. Yeah, it's now a Tauromyces. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's been found in Spain, but it was amazing mm -hmm. to me that it was Very just rare, all right? over. Yes. Yeah. Some of these things are, I'm sure, quite rare and endemic in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, having taken one species of plants in Sydney and found really... Uh, 10 or 15 species that we didn't see anywhere else. And knowing there were 2,000 species of flowering plants in the Sydney Basin, uh, I hate to think just how many species there really are out there in, in, in niches like that that uh, would have to be sampled uh, separately to actually find just what their endemic uh, flora is. And uh, who knows just how many species of, of these genera really are out there. So how many uh, labs does CSIRO have? It's a very big, big organization yeah. even now, although it's got somewhat smaller in recent years. You had an excellent beetle person at one of the labs, uh, Carpenter, oh, yes. who mm. come from Harvard originally. I think there, are, there were at its peak about 7,000 employees and probably yeah. 35 labs 
Uh, there were 25 different divisions mm -hmm. because CSIRO does everything from radio astronomy through to wildlife management. Oh, okay. uh, and, uh, so it's broader it's than It's an our extremely USDA. broad organization. Uh, the division I was in, food, was a little comparable to USDA in its, its setup and scope, mm -hmm. but we do so many different things beyond that. In the days when uh, Michael Tracy was my chief, we didn't do medicine because he said medicine is not science. <laughs> but now CSIRO is doing a lot of medical research as well and in epigenetics and things like this as well. We're uh, extremely broadly based. The management now, however, has turned more towards being entrepreneurial and to find things where money can be made and government funding has declined. So my laboratory, which I set up really uh, in 1968-69 when I came back from Peoria, and set up the lab with mycology and with a culture collection, I think will probably all fade away now. Uh, I'm not going to be replaced. They've essentially told me that, um, much as I'm long past retirement age. And uh, I think my lab will, will be finished when I retire. I don't think there will be anyone left in Australia who actually understands about fungi and foods at all. Until the next problem comes along. And then they'll have to find someone new because the food industry is very large in Australia. It's a very important industry. Mm -hmm. And yet there is no understanding that we need to have someone who understands about the mycology. And I don't know how it is in other countries, but in the United States, do you know what the Peoria lab was budgeted this year? No. $200,000, which would pay for Goodness. someone to close the place down. Yes. Oh. And luckily, it, it wasn't Gee. accepted. Gee. The Congress did for once get on to it, but mm. um, we have a commissioner of agriculture called Sonny Perdue. I think he's secretary is his, the term. Mm. Sonny Perdue, P-E-R-D-U-E. And I think he was a farmer, but I'm not sure, maybe a um, beef farmer. But um, I noticed that in USDA things now that come out about Purdue University, they spell it with an E instead of a U because they've got a boss called Sonny Purdue. <laughs> yes. So anyway, but um, so so when did your family go to Australia? Do you know? Yes, my my uh, three times great grandmother moved to Australia in 1801. So I'm a sixth generation okay. Australian. Uh, she. Uh, had an interesting story because her husband had died and they'd been quite well off I think but it turned out that when he died that he gambled away the fortune as often happens and she found herself with five teenage children and no money oh my gosh. and it also happened and this is luck comes into life doesn't it that she had a cousin by marriage whose name was Lord Nelson who the, from, had won the Battle of Trafalgar that one? And he was With a very the one arm famous. And the one leg and the one eye. He was a very famous man, and she happened to be. We happened to be cousins by marriage with the Nelson. So, she wrote to her cousin Lord Nelson, and I think probably essentially said, "Hey, mate, I'm out of luck. What am I going to do with this lot I've got here?" And he wrote back and said, "Get on a ship, take them to New South Wales. I'll look after you." So, so help me, she took the five teenage children to Sydney in the days when Sydney was a new penal colony. <laughs> Free settlers were, were almost unknown there. <laughs> and she spent about a year, I've been told, in, in extreme penure because she had no real funds of her own. So but he didn't then, look after her. Then the letter from Lord Nelson turned up oh. <laughs> and they gave her extensive land grants around Sydney and the family prospered <laughs> until the generation when my father uh, unfortunately, he was one of 17 children. Mm. And uh, although his father was quite well off, my father uh, didn't like being in the bank or being working in the city. He ran away from home and went out in the country and became a farmer, uh, worked on farms for almost nothing in those days, the Depression times when he, he said uh, five shillings a week and, and, and keep was all that he, he actually got. So by the time I came along, there was no money left in the family at all. But it had been for a while a prosperous family, and some areas of it probably what did still he are. Farm? We farmed mixed, uh, mixed things. He had both fruit and vegetables, but we only owned 17 acres, and half of that was bushland. So we essentially lived off about five acres of property, and we grew. Uh, he was a very good farmer, uh, just that the farm wasn't big enough to be economical. 
He didn't really need you there. <laughs> and he really wanted his children to stay on the farm and he never forgave us for leaving. There was no question of that. He cut us out from his will and, and because we simply oh, really? hadn't done what he wanted. And yet, uh, I, having worked on a farm as a child, which I did very hard, meant that later on when I started working with farmers in uh, things like the biocontrol work on aflatoxin peanuts and also work on dried fruit, I understood how to talk to farmers and how to associate with farmers and work with farmers and my farm upbringing was of great value to me. But there's no way I ever wanted to be a farmer. No, not in the world did I ever want to take on farming. So I was very lucky that I landed on my feet and, and worked with CSIRO all my life. I've really had a very lucky life, thank you. And uh, I've enjoyed it most of the time very much. Anything else that we didn't talk about you want to fill in with? Or? Rob and I also started the um, International Commission on Food Mycology, which is still operating very well. And the collaboration that we had with that and with the, Institute, the uh, International Commission on, uh, uh, on Penicillium and Aspergillus were extremely effective. It was nice to have collaborators around the world. I've, my other uh, major work really in the last years, the last 20 years, has been in Brazil. Uh, in the n n 1990s, a Brazilian lady, uh, Maria uh, Marta Tanawaki, wrote to me and said, I would like to come and do a PhD with you. And we wrote back and said, we don't have any money, it's not possible. The third time she wrote and said, I have the money, I really want to do a PhD with you, we took her on and she did a very good PhD and went back to Brazil. And after she'd got back and established herself, she invited me to come and teach food mycology with her and to work on mycotoxin problems in Brazil. And Martha and I had probably now 20 years of very good association where I've gone to Brazil every couple of years and we've worked on all the major mycotoxins in Brazil where they're much bigger problems. Uh, Brazil, uh, San Paulo State in Brazil, long ago established that they would spend 2% of GDP on research, which meant that mm, of yeah. all kinds, uh, which means they make aeroplanes, they, they make buses, they have become the powerhouse of Latin America, but also meant that when she wanted money to do work on food mycology, she could get it. Uh, it meant that we were able to, to really work on the problems of cocoa and coffee and uh, and rice and other commodities in the Latin American area. And that to me has been a very fruitful association. And I think because of the teaching we did, uh, food mycology in Latin America overall is now extremely well. And we had a real role in that, simply because we were teaching real food mycology every couple of years and we had 60 or 70 students every two years for during the whole of this last 20 years. 2% uh, sounds a lot, that's what uh NATO. It's a lot of money. That's what NATO is mm. supposed to, the NATO mm. members are supposed to contribute yeah. by 2024. <laughs> it was an interesting story because San Paulo State tried to secede from Brazil and there was a big war in 1935 which San Paulo lost. And that was when the governor, governor of San Paulo State said, uh, if we can't secede, we're going to beat them. And so he said, we're going to spend 2% of GDP on research and now San Paulo State is the powerhouse of all of Latin America. And it's a direct result of that. Whereas the Australian government won't spend any money on research and so my lab effectively will close uh, at, when I finish. Mm -hmm. and this is the way life goes. So, Thank you for that. 